Okay, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome back to our meeting. We will have um, session three today. And um, I hope you've been enjoying watching the contributed talks online. And we will have a slight change of program this morning. Um, Matias Ormani will be speaking now. Uh, and we moved the slot of Cristina Chiappini to Friday evening. Thanks a lot, Mattia, for your availability and, and for stepping in and for being able to finish your talk two days in advance of the original schedule. This, this must be a record amongst astronomers. Um, so great, this is very appreciated. Um, without further ado, I just need to mentioned that, uh, as you know, we are recording the live sessions. They will be available shortly after they end, about an hour, uh, depends on how much time we, we take to process the videos. And uh, if you don't want to be in the recording, simply don't turn on your camera or your microphone, okay? So, Mattia, you can start whenever you want, and I will give you a warning when you have three minutes left, okay? Thanks, Dimitri. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, does it work? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, good. So um, thanks uh, for inviting me to this uh, conference. So uh, <clears throat> uh, I want to talk about the formation of uh, gaseous nuclear rings and then of, of stellar nuclear disks. So I divided the talk in two parts. The first part is about the gas uh, ring and, the and then about the, the stellar uh, disks. So let let's start with the first. Um, so, it has been known for uh, many, many years, many decades, uh, that uh, nuclear rings are very easy to form in simulations. So, you just take uh, a barrel potential, you let gas flow in this barrel potential, and then uh, you form nuclear rings. So, here I'm just showing three simulations in which uh, uh, you see clearly that uh, in the center you form uh, a ring-like structure, and they all look similar. A, quick, a key question that I think is still not being answered uh, in full is what controls the radius of this ring? What, what is special about this location? And can we predict it in a, in, a, in a simple, maybe analytical way? And there have been various theories that have been uh, proposed. <laughs> My opinion is that uh, none of them actually works. But before discussing why, I want to, to show you a few key facts using uh, numerical experiments. So the first numerical experiment is this. You take a potential um, that, uh, uh, so you, you run a, a number of simulations. The only difference between the simulation is the rotation curve. So uh, here, as you go to the right, you decrease the central concentration of the rotation curve. In, in other words, on the right, there is less mass in the center and on the left there is more mass in the center and you can see that the size of the ring decreases as you go to the right so from this we learn the first thing which is the size of the nuclear ring depends on the rotation curve okay then you do another experiment you say okay i keep the rotation curve fixed and i change only the quadruple of the gravitational potential so only the non-axisymmetric part and as you see here you change it and the size of the ring also decreases or changes. So from this, you learn that the size of the nuclear ring does not only depend on the rotation curve. It also depends on the non-axisymmetric part of the gravitational potential. Then you also can try to keep the same uh, rotation curve and the same non-axisymmetric part of the potential, but you change the pattern speed of the bar. So you just make the, the potential rotate differently. And you see that also the size depends on this. So again, the size of the nuclear ring does not only depend on the rotation curve, but also on how fast the potential rotates. Okay. Then you do another experiment. You say, I keep the same potential rotating at the same uh, pattern speed, and I only change the equation of state of the gas. Everything else is exactly the same. 
So if you have an isothermal uh, equation of state, that's the simplest option, you change the gas sound speed. And as you change the gas sound speed, you can see that the size of the ring changes and also it, it changes quite dramatically. It's not like a minor change. So from this, you learn that the size of the nuclear ring does not only depend on the gravitational potential, but it also depends strongly on the equation of state of the gas. Okay. So, okay. So these are the first three facts. Fact number four is that if you have a gravitational potential that does not have X2 orbits, then you cannot form a nuclear ring. So here are two potentials which are very similar. They only change slightly in the center. You can see that the flow in the outer part is exactly the same. The only difference is in the inner part on the left, there are no X2 orbits in this potential. On the right, there are X2 orbits. Uh, and you see that here there is no ring and here there is a ring. So to produce a, new, a nuclear ring, the, the potential must have X2 orbits. This has been pointed out also various times. And so from this, you learn that the ring will be in the radial range where the orbits exist but you don't know where it is in this range because the fact that the orbits exist doesn't mean that they are populated by gas. The orbits are just a, a property of the gravitational potential and they can be filled with gas or not. And, and what you don't know is where the ring will be in this, in this range. Uh, so for example, if you go back to this, uh, the X2 orbits are exactly the same in all panels here because the potential is the same, but the ones that are populated change from left to right. And the final fact that I want to highlight is that the size of the ring is determined locally. What does this mean? It, it means that it does not depend on the full large scale flow. So if you remove all the X1 orbits, the dust lanes, the large scale flow, and you start with a disk of gas on X2 orbits uh, like this. So the larger scale flow here, there is nothing. Uh, and then you let it go, then the, the ring will shrink to reach the same final size that you would have if you had all the large scale flow and stuff. So in this sense, it, it's local. Okay, so in summary, the size of nuclear rings depends on the gravitational potential, on the equation of state of the gas, and it's, it's determined locally. So let's now look at the various theories to explain the size of the rings. So the theory one, is that uh, the ring forms, uh, this has been proposed uh, at least a couple of times in the literature, uh, where the shear that you calculate from the rotation curve reaches a minimum. This is because uh, where it's minimum, uh, the viscosity is minimum, and so uh, the viscous transport uh, decreases and uh, you accumulate gas. This theory, uh, it's easy to refute because uh, it predicts that the radius of the ring depends only on the rotation curve, but as I said, it doesn't depend only on the rotation curve. So this refutes the theory. Theory number two is that the ring forms at the location of the inner limbrad resonances. Uh, again, this is incompatible with the fact number three, because according to this theory, the radius of the ring depends only on the gravitational potential, but in reality it depends also on the equation of state of the gas strongly. So this theory cannot be fully correct. Also in the Milky Way, which is the galaxy for which I think the gravitational potential is known with the highest accuracy, and we have the most precise measurements, uh, you can see the name the Limbrad resonance is at radius much larger than the gas ring. Theory number three is that the ring forms where the residual angular momentum from the gas inflowing because of the bar uh, larger scales balances the external gravity. But I think this is also incorrect because as I described, the, the radius of the ring is determined locally. It doesn't change if you remove all the large scale flow or not. Finally, there is a theory by me, which says that the ring forms <laughs> where the X2 orbits uh, uh, have this region of reverse shear. So I think this was a very clever idea, but uh, it doesn't work because <laughs> for the same reason, it doesn't work at theory number two. So, <clears throat> okay. So what, what do we do then? Uh, well, my, my current uh, theory or idea is that the basic principle for the ring formation was, is essentially the same that was described a long time ago by Goldrick and Tremaine. 
And they apply this to explain gaps in Saturn rings. So here you see, this is an image of Saturn. You see there is a, a gap here, and this is called the Cassini division. Uh, so here is, is a zoom in on the Cassini division. This is a, is a real picture. And you see that here, there is the Cassini division. And the theory is that the resonance uh, occurs in the gap. And the, the gap gets cleared out of gas. The gas that is in this gap moves inwards and accumulates at the inner edge here. So you see this uh, accumulation of stuff at the inner edge. Uh, yeah. How does this apply to nuclear rings? So what I think happens is that if you have a weak bar potential, like here on the left, you have the inner Lindbergh resonance and uh, um, the, the weak bar potential excites density waves that clear out a small region in the vicinity of the resonance. So this is what uh, the Goldrick and Tremaine paper was about. So this is, let's say, proven uh, analytically in various ways. When you increase the strength of the bar potential, for example, this gap widens. And in the case of a strong bar potential, this is, this is what you get. So essentially the region that is cleared out becomes bigger and bigger. And all the gas in this region is channeled inwards and accumulates at, uh, until it reaches the inner edge of, of this region where the gas gets cleared out by density waves excited by the bar. Um, okay. So, yes, as I said, the gap, this uh, widens for uh, stronger bars. It clearly depends also on the pattern speed because the position of the, res the resonance depends on the pattern speed and so on. Uh, it also depends on the sound speed, crucially, because uh, the width of the region that gets cleared out depends on the coupling between uh, the bar potential and the free wet density waves that uh, can, can can uh, travel in the disk. And the wavelength of these waves depends on the sound speed. So the region where the coupling uh, becomes effective uh, becomes larger and larger as you increase the sound speed. The process is local in the sense that if you put back some material in the uh, cleared out forbidden region, uh, whatever you want to call it, essentially it gets thrown back to the inner edge. So if you, you put something here and then after a while it, it falls back on the inner edge. And I also want you to know that this is exactly the opposite of the theory that gas accumulates at the resonance, because this is telling you that the resonance is the region where the gas is, is cleared out. Okay, so that uh, concludes my first part of the talk. Uh, and now I want to move to stellar nuclear disks. So the gas that accumulates in these nuclear rings, regardless of which theory you believe it is correct, uh, starts vigorously forming stars. And over time, these stars accumulate and build up a nuclear stellar disk. So I, I will use uh, uh, the Milky Way nuclear stellar disk as a case study because it's the one that I, I worked on the most. So let's first look at the current state of the Milky Way nuclear disk. So this is the, uh, the nuclear disk of the Milky Way in, uh, in stellar counts in the K band. So you can see it's essentially this green structure here is the nuclear disk, not to be confused with the nuclear star cluster, which is this smaller uh, uh, structure here. So a few numbers, uh, the total mass of the nuclear disk is about 10 to the 9 solar masses. The radius is about 120 parsecs, scale height 45 parsecs. This dominates the gravitational potential of the Milky Way in the range of 30 to 300 parsecs from the center. And as far as we know, looks axisymmetric, but it could be uh, non axisymmetric so a nuclear bar. This is hard to, to determine in, in projection. So the stars in the nuclear stellar disk overlap very well with the dense gas in the uh, central molecular zone uh, gas ring, as you can see here. So this already suggests that there is a, a pretty strong connection between the two. Uh, the nuclear stellar disk also rotates as you can see here. So here, uh, red starts moving away from you and um, blue moving towards you. And you see that this side moves away, this side comes towards you. And uh, it's only for the nuclear disk. When you look at the bulge, you don't see this, uh, this strong rotation. 
and uh, uh, the gas and the stars rotate with roughly similar uh, velocities. So again, this shows you that there must be some connection between the gas and the stars. Uh, recently, um, I published a paper in which we uh, did the uh, fully self-consistent dynamical models of the Milky Way nuclear disk. Uh, and here I just show an example. So here is the, is the, is the star counts. Here is the model. And then we fitted the, the line of sight distrib um, kinematic distribution. So both line of sight velocities and proper motions to the model in each of these observational fields from the uh, CMOS survey of Fritz et al. So for each survey, so for each field, we constructed this distribution and we modeled them as the sum of the bar and the nuclear disk. And then we found the parameters of the nuclear disk that fit this the best. Uh, and we derived the, um, our best fitting model. So this is the surface density of the model. Uh, of course, because our model is 6D, so three position and three velocities, you can on, also plot uh, the model in various uh, spaces. So you can see the line of sight velocities of the stars. You can predict the proper motions in the direction perpendicular to the plane, parallel to the plane, and so on. Okay, so that's the current status. What about uh, the evolution in time of the nuclear disk? So the central molecular zone of the Milky Way, as in most barred galaxies, is continuously fed by fresh, uh, with fresh gas from the bar. And this gas forms stars, which increase the mass of the nuclear disk uh, over time. So yes, the, the inflow happens mostly through these uh, features known as bar dust lane. And the current bar driven inflow rate onto the central molecular zone is uh, observationally determined as roughly 0.8 solar mass per year. And the current star formation rate of the CMZ is uh, roughly 0.1 solar mass per year. So if you integrate this over a few giga years, uh, then it gives you roughly the mass, the current mass of the nuclear disk. So the star formation in CMZ clearly contributes substantially to the build-up of the nuclear disk. Uh, there could be also a contribution from a globular cluster infall and mergers, maybe uh, that infall due to dynamical friction, but this, is, uh, this contribution is currently uh, unknown. And uh, simulations suggest that uh, a substantial fraction of the nuclear stellar disk mass forms shortly after the bar formation. Uh, so here, this is a plot from uh, simulations of Baba and Cavata. They have uh, a live and body simulation uh, coupled to, to the gas. And their simulation forms a bar at this point. And then you see the star formation rate uh, has a, an increase here. There is a very, uh, so there is about a one giga year period where the, uh, a lot of stars are formed in the nuclear disk. And then uh, they continue to form the nuclear disk uh, nuclear ring continues to form stars at a steady but lower uh, rate. And um, Baba and Kawata, they also argue that in this way you can time, uh, the, the, you can use this to derive the, the age of the bar. And uh, this picture seems consistent with the star formation history of the nuclear disk determined by Noguera Slara, in which, uh, uh, so he found that. Uh, most of the stars in the nuclear disk appear to be older than eight giga years. So if this is true, and uh, in the picture of Baba and Kavata, this would suggest that the bar is at least eight giga years old. And on this, I recommend also to see the talk by, by Jason uh, on the formation history of the bar and nuclear disk using the Myra variables. Uh, Finally, I want to mention that uh, uh, <clears throat> regarding the evolution of the nuclear disk, the simulations uh, fully support the scenario in which uh, nuclear disks grow inside out. That was proposed by Bittner et al. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, Dimitri and uh, Camilla, they also talk about this in their, uh, in their talks. So I recommend you to, to have a look. Um, so he, here I show an example. This is a simulation by CU et al. And you see, this is the time, one giga year, 1.5, two, and so on. And you see that the nuclear ring grows in time. Matia, sorry, uh, three minutes, please. Thank you. Um, so here is a zoom in the central region of the same uh, simulation, in which you can see at the beginning, the gas essentially 
goes directly to the center. And then over time, it increases. This fact has a simple explanation, which is what, in the first part of the talk, I mentioned that uh, the size of nuclear rings in simulations uh, depends on how much the rotation curve is centrally concentrated. So as you increase this, the central mass, the, the size of the ring becomes larger. So here, what you have is that at the beginning, there is no central mass concentration. Then it starts from stars and you build up some of the mass. And then, so you start building up a nuclear disk and the mass of the nuclear disk itself changes the rotation curve and makes the, the nuclear ring bigger. These form stars, these stars are further out. You increase more again, the central mass concentration and, and, and it grows inside out. Um, so this brings me to my conclusion, which is the gas nuclear ring, I think form because density waves excited by the bar clear out a region around the inner limb of resonance and gas accumulates at the inner edge of this region where uh, density waves can be uh, effectively excited. The radius of the nuclear rings depends in a non-trivial way on both the gravitational potential and the gas equation of state. And I think any theory that so um, wants to explain their formation has to, um, to explain also these two key facts. Star formation in gas nuclear rings is clearly a, a very prominent part in the building uh, up of the nuclear stellar disk over time. And simulations suggest that uh, a substantial portion of the nuclear disk mass forms shortly after the bar formation. And then after this initial phase, the nuclear disk evolved by growing uh, inside out. And there is both uh, uh, observational and uh, simulation evidence for this. And um, this is my last sl slide. I will just want to highlight a few open questions. Uh, can we predict uh, the radius of the nuclear rings in, in a simple analytical way? I still haven't managed to, managed to do that. Uh, if any of you is interested, please get in touch with me. What fraction of the nuclear disk mass forms due to globular uh, cluster infall versus the in situ star formation in the ring? How does the star formation of history of the nuclear disk of the Milky Way depend on radius? If they grow inside out, the star formation history should be different for different uh, radii. How, how does it uh, happen? And uh, finally, why, why some nuclear disks become nuclear bars and others don't? What's the, the difference? And are axisymmetric nuclear disks uh, dissolved bars? So they were bars and then over time they, they heat up and they dissolve into axisymmetric nuclear disks? I, I don't know. So thanks. Thank you very much, Mattia. This was a very nice summary. Um, do we have questions from? In the audience, yes, we have uh, Paola Di Matteo. Um, we will try to unmute you, Paola. Uh, can you yeah. hear me? Yes. Oh, ciao, Mattia. Thank you very much for uh, for the nice talk. Um, I had I have a question and a comment about the first part uh, of your talk. Um, so where, uh, where you discuss uh, essentially the different location of, uh, of your inner ring depending also on the strength of the bar. So um, if I remember correctly, one of the main arguments to suggest that this ring should be an inner ring resonance is related to the gas flows that should change uh, direction each time we cross the resonance, right? So did you try to plot these gas flows? Uh, uh, you have a slide, sorry, I didn't, uh, uh, I don't know which, but the one where you have the three uh, situation, a weak bar, a moderate bar, and a strong bar. And did you try to plot really the, the gas flows in these uh, three scenarios to see uh, uh, how they go and uh, how they relate to the inner uh, lean blood resonance also because this location won't be infinitely thin. So, so this is my question, and then maybe I can uh, link to the comment because it was on the same thing you were saying. Well, in the Milky Way, in some sense, this the galaxy for which we know the potential in, in the in the best way, and 
I'm not that sure that we know the potential so well uh, in the inner regions. I mean, if you simply look at uh, galactic models uh, that we use for integration, uh, uh, they, they can be very different in, in the inner few KPC of the galaxy. And so, yes, uh, I'm, I'm a bit more moderate on, the, on how well we know the potential in the, in the inner regions of the Milky Way. Yeah. But thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> yes, I, I I think I know what you are referring to with this picture that the, the, the torques essentially uh, put the gas on. So that is based on this uh, epicycle approximation and the works of some works in the eighties, but it's basically a qualitative picture of what they suggested it should happen. But when you look at the simulation, that's not at all what happens. Uh, so the idea is that like the um, you, they think about the spiral arms as a, some kind of, a, of rigid structure, say, oh, the spiral arm is in the region where the torque, if it's above the resonance, it's the, in the region where the torques are positive and so, or sorry, negative, and so it brings it towards the resonance. If it's inside, the torques are positive, and so it brings it towards the resonance. But, th but that is simply not true. If you look at the simulation, it's not true, but also if you look at the paper of Goldrake and Tremaine, which addresses the same problem, in an analytical in an analytical way, uh, that's in the limit of weak bars. But they find uh, that the region around the resonance is a region where the uh, the spir these spiral waves remove angular momentum. So it's it's the opposite, and that's that, that can be proven analytically, and that is completely uh, accepted in the. Uh, 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 planetary rings uh, community. So I, I have no idea why in the galactic community we have the opposite. Um, and the second question about the potential, uh, well, that uh, I, I, I think is, um, if you look at my last papers, uh, on, so the potential in this, in this region, as I said, is dominated by the nuclear stellar disk. And there are not, there were not good models of the nuclear disks, but now, now there are. I think uh, if you look at the uncertainties that we have in our paper, the, the mass and the radial profile of the nuclear disk are relatively well constrained. So uh, if you look at where the inner Lindbergh resonance can be within the uncertainties, yes, it can move from maybe uh, 800 parsecs from the center to one point. Uh, two kiloparsecs. I'm just saying plausible numbers, but it will never be at a hundred parsec where the central molecular zone is. So it's always at a much larger radius than the, than the gas ring. But you can see those also in simulations, uh, if the, like the Baba and Kavata, they have a plot in which they show the size of the nuclear rings and disk and the inner Lindbergh resonance, and it's clearly outside as a function of time, M many, many. All right, good. Uh, so we have another question from Camila now. Um, hi, Mattia. Uh, thank you. It was a very good talk. Uh, I wanted to ask in this scenario that you're proposing about the gas, you have a gap that depends on the bar, uh, which I didn't understand is that you also accumulate material outside of the gap or just inside? No, I think mostly inside. Essentially, all the material in the gap is channeled inwards. Outside, you should not really have uh, an accumulation. Okay. I think that's more or less what you see if you look at the uh, parrot galaxies, right? You see that there is this uh, gap region with uh, a low amount of gas mm -hmm. because all the gas that was in that region or that, that you can put in that region uh, mm -hmm. flows to the center within a short uh, time a few time, dynamical times. Yeah, because with the cartoon, I was a bit uh, confused, but yeah, okay. That I, makes sense. I was, I was, uh, I mean, <laughs> it was very, very simplified and uh, yeah, I just want yeah. to steal some discussion. <laughs> <laughs> also, just a comment about the open questions um, about the star formation history for different radii. Uh, we showed this in our talk, in my talk, I showed this, but no, not for the Milky Way, but for another galaxy. We do, um, we analyze the star formation history in different radii to show the inside out growth too. So just to, just to address this open question. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, we have uh, maybe a final question from Victor. 
Uh, ciao, Mattia. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask you a quick question about something that you know very well, I'm sure. Uh, Bini in the 90s, right, told us that where the gas settles depends upon where the X1 orbits self intersect, and that's where the gas shocks and falls in. So that, uh, first of all, the resolution of, as you know, again, you know this very well, the resolution of the simulations you do with the calculations you do, determine where the gas settles. So does that matter at all where the gas finally settles uh, on the size of the nuclear ring that you get? Uh, yeah, I mean, I wonder if you can comment about that, basically. Um, well, I thought so in the past, but now I'm not so convinced anymore. So certainly, I, I think that's that's a, um, a how to say sufficient condition, like. If the gas reaches the self-intersecting X1 orbits, of course, it has to flow inwards. Yeah. But then where does it settle inwards? Like there are, uh, this only tells you uh, it must be inside that, but where inside? And as I, as I, as I showed in the, in the first part, um, even if you remove, so if you start just with the gas on X2 orbits already, uh, without this larger scale flow, it still shrinks to the same final size. So um, for sure, the X1 orbits tell you, you, you cannot have gas larger than this, but where it is inside, it's, it's not determined by that. Um, also, the shocks, uh, yes, so the shocks must form if the X1 orbits are self-intersecting, but they also form if they are very elongated, because if you have a very cusped X1 orbit, maybe it's not self-intersecting, but still the gas slows down so much at the upper center mm -hmm. that still you get a stalling point and then you get a shock. So the position of the shock is not necessarily the, when they become self-intersecting, but can be also a little bit further out. Okay. And depends on the equation of state too. That of course yeah. it's complex. Mm. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Um, so uh, we we are running a little bit late, but I will mention a question and a comment that Adriana De Lorenzo Casares put on the on the chat of Zoom. So the comment is first that in timer. <laughs> We have uh, proposed, uh, she has a paper about this 2019, I think, uh, that bars form in nuclear disks just as, as, as they form in normal, in normal main disks. Right? So the, the nuclear disk forms far, first and then the bar instability develops and, and forms the nuclear disk. Um, so, so she says both, both structures can coexist. And, and her question is, I, I don't know how much you can say about this, but what about rings in non-barred galaxies? Yeah, um, I don't know. I think what I described was uh, only for barred galaxies. For non-barred galaxies, uh, I, I don't know. Are, are the properties of the nuclear disks uh, different? Like, do they rotate the same uh, in non-barred galaxies? I, I I don't know. I, I, I cannot, I don't know if Adrian... Uh, normally, well, what happens normally is that the disk is, is also, um, I mean, asymmetric, no? I mean, maybe you don't have a bar, but you have an asymmetric potential because it's, uh, yeah, it's um, somehow disturbed. Because normally when you, when you don't have a bar, you normally have that. At least that's what uh, coming on in the, in the paper of the Atlas of the Nuclear Rings, that was clean. Yeah, I think, I think, this is a good good question. I mean, I think we don't really understand very well nuclear rings in unbarred galaxies and their origin. Uh, maybe it's different from barred galaxies, I suppose. So, okay, we need to move on. We are. You want to say that's something else? One, yeah. That's one sentence. Maybe the globular cluster info has something to do with this. I don't know, but yeah, it's an open question. Hmm. We need to move on. We are running a little bit late, but uh, it's okay. The discussions are very nice. Uh, we have a slight little change again, and we are swapping Patricia and Aura. So Aura, uh, whenever you're ready, please. Uh, wait one second, I have to make you co-host. And whenever you're ready, you can share your screen and unmute yourself. Yeah. 
Thanks, thanks for stepping in also again <laughs> at the last minute. Okay. Hi, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, I'll try to go to uh, presentation mode first. It's okay? Yeah, it's not full screen, I think. Uh, At least for me. Hi, for me it's full screen, I don't know. I think you need to share the whole. Um, yeah, the whole screen. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now it works. Full screen. Yes. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so, <laughs> good morning. And thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, today I'm going to be talking about bulges in cosmological simulation, and I'm going to show um, some of our work uh, done in collaboration with many, many people that have put it here down. Um, first of all, I saw also that there's a very lively discussion on Slack about what is the defi a good definition for a bulge, and I think people do not agree on one. So um, this is, uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about what's the, uh, what we can do in, in simulations where we have the full uh, 6D phase space information. So then actually we can go way beyond just photometric bulge disk decomposition. Um, in particular in cosmological simulation, the most widely used um, parameters to separate bulges, uh, sphere, let's say spheroids from disks are angular momentum or angular momentum and binding energy. And this is, uh, has started with the work of Mario Abadi in 2003, uh, where he showed that <coughs> um, if we take the uh, stars that are mostly on circular orbits, we're gonna get the disk. So it, it, um, in the figure on the, on the, um, on the right, you can see the azimuthal angular momentum of stellar particles as a function of binding energy on the x-axis. Um, and in the in little inset in the figure, you see that uh, disk stars concentrate towards a circularity parameter of one, while the spheroid is um, um, considered to be uh, symmetric around zero, so from minus one to one, and whatever the, is in between um, is associated to a thick disk. So uh, this method has been used in many, many papers. Um, most people just assume some hard cut in this circularity parameter. So the azimuthal angular momentum normalized to the angular momentum of circular orbits of the same binding energy. Uh, more recently, we've started to use clustering methods instead of just putting hard cuts. And basically my talk is gonna be um, based on clustering methods. Um, so a few years back, we, we made public a little code called Galactic Structure Finder, which does exactly this. Uh, so it uses angular momentum and energy, uh, basically the parameter space uh, proposed by Dominic Morales et al. in 2012. Uh, and also considers not only the azimuthal angular momentum, but whatever is left of uh, the angular momentum. So the one that with um, um, the component that will uh, quantify the out of plane movements of the stars. So we have three parameters. And instead of k-means as in the original paper, we switched to Gaussian mixture models because it allows to go for uh, very unequal clusters. So for example, you could also find stellar halos like this, which are supposed to be uh, way, uh, to have uh, way smaller mass than the other galactic components. Plus it allows for an unconstrained covariance. And in the first, uh, in our first paper, we just use our, let's say, biased physics informed eye to judge how many components are in a galaxy and to associate them to some historical components, let's say. And in the figure, you can see, for example, one galaxy that can be split into five different components from a thin disk, thick disk, two, two kinds of bulges. So one which is more spherically symmetric and has no traces or rotation, which we call a classical bulge. 
and one which is a bit flattened and has some traces of rotation, which we call a pseudo bulge. And we can also see at uh, the lowest binding energies, we have the stellar halo. Uh, more recently, we've been updating the code to make it uh, more standard, to read standard uh, uh, HDFI uh, files. And we want to go beyond just this uh, particular feature space to do galaxy component separation and look, for example, at what people in the Milky Way community do, uh, looking at uh, abundant spaces or mixing metallicities uh, and dynamical properties of stars. And we also introduce an information based criteria that can separate automatically the number of components. So, but in the original, in, in the original implementation, we looked at the Milky Way galaxy. Actually, it's a, a, one galaxy from the Nihao simulation suite that is exactly at the Milky Way, at the uh, assumed Milky Way stellar mass. And we look at what happens to this galaxy. So in the bottom, um, in the bottom panel, you have the edge on view of the stellar mass of the whole galaxy. What happens if we, uh, split it in two like this. So we get a spheroid and a disc in the three, uh, in the three parameter uh, uh, space. If we go to three components, we can get a thin disc, a thick disc and something that is in the center, we just call it bulge. If we go to four, uh, we have something more extended, uh, but dispersion dominant, which we call a spheroid and something more concentrated in the center, which we still call a bulge. And finally, if we go to five, we can actually pick the stellar halo. So, which is the last component here and it's given in magenta, you see that at the, the lowest binding energies and the bulge. So the central region uh, are separated into this uh, pseudo bulge, so uh, flattened and with some traces of rotation and a classical bulge, which is uh, very spherically symmetric and has no rotation. And it's important that these two components are very bound. So the difference between the, the pseudo bulge, classical bulge, and the halo is that the bulges are very bound while the halo is very loosely bound. So um, we looked at a lot of uh, properties of these components because in Milky Way, we can actually compare with detailed uh, data for thin disk, thick disk, even, even if the definitions are not exactly the same. So for example, the, the velocities at the solar uh, radius, the uh, rotational velocities of the thin and thick disk are very close to observational values. Um, <clears throat> and as well, the circular velocity of this halo is very close to what's uh, been observed for the Milky Way. The interesting thing is that if you do the surface mass density profile of these dynamically selected components, all three dispersion dominated components have a CERSIC index of one. So, and this is not like, it's, this is not a, a one case. It happens in a lot of galaxies, not always, but uh, it was a, a first indication that um, mm, for us is like, it's not it, the, using CERSIC index is not such a good idea to classify uh, comp galaxy components. The most interesting thing in simulation actually comes from the fact that you can trace back in time the individual components, especially if you have like in, in the particular case of this galaxy that have been simulating with an SPH code, this is very straightforward to do. So in, in, in mesh codes, it's a bit more complicated because you need to have tracer particles. But in SPH, it's very easy to go back in time. And that's what we did here. Um, by following the, the redshift zero mass that was in each type of component separately. And in the top figure, you can see how the, the progenitor mass of each component assembles inside the halo. So the halo is the black, the thick black line, how it grows the mass. And you see, for example, that the, the two bulges, the material that will form the redshift zero bulges is the one that collapses first inside the halo. And so on, and on much faster, uh, on much shorter time scales, uh, with, with when compared to the disk material. And we can also look. So this is just the uh, uh, baryonic progenitor material. So the um, some part of it is still gas here, 
but we can also look at the star formation buildup if of each component separately and component by component. And for example, here we compare the total with the Van Dokum prediction for uh, for the stellar mass buildup of a Milky Way mass galaxy today. And um, I don't know if it's very informative, but in particular, this galaxy falls <laughs> right on top of it. Okay, so and in, in another way, we can also look at the, at the individual star formation rate history of the virus bulges uh, of the virus component. Uh, here is for a more graphical uh, perspective of what actually happens. So you see on top is the, the material of the redshift zero stellar halo, how it builds up inside the galaxy from redshift three to redshift zero. Um, and actually it turns out that the stellar halo has the oldest stars but was assembled uh, like the assembly time is the later one while the first the uh, most mass is assembled first in the classical bulge then in the pseudo bulge and then pick this and hint this at the end um, we can also quantify uh, a bit more this kind of figures by looking at uh, like the uh, extension like the size occupied by these particles uh, with redshift and basically we see the same thing that I've just said that the material of the classical bulge is the first one to collapse inside the inside the object. And the other interesting case, interesting thing for this galaxy in particular is that the tracks for the pseudo bulge and for the thin thick disk are very close together. So it's like the pseudo bulge is sort of the seed of the thick disk that we will see at redshift zero. Um, we also went, then we went to look at more galaxies. So we look at the sample that spans from dwarfs to Andromeda mass galaxies. And we noticed that for the little, little guys, it doesn't make sense to go beyond two components. So we can only separate a spheroid and a disk like this. While for the bigger galaxy, we have all sorts of things inside, right? We have uh, something which we call inner disks, which are actually very close to bars. They are bars in many cases. And we have these two types of classical bulge and pseudo bulge. Uh, and a spheroid, which we defined, uh, I will jump to this page because this is more clear. So what we mean by these components, classical bulge is very bound, compact, spherical and non-rotating. A pseudo bulge is bound, compact, flattened, and has some rotation. Uh, the pseudo bulge, the spheroid is bound, but it, it, it's extended, while the halo is loosely bound and very extended. And on top of that, you have the inner disks, or let's say bars, that are a separate class because the rotation is very strong in this, uh, in this type of component. So, uh, they look quite decent when compared to observation in terms of mass. The, uh, the bottom left figure shows the mass in these components compa compared to the sample of Comoron et al. 2013. And, um, and they also um, they have the expected uh, uh, variation in shape, uh, so shape versus uh, uh, rotational support disks are at one and very flattened while the, uh, the dispersion dominated components are close to spherically symmetric and more dispersion dominated. And there's, they also separate quite nicely in the angular momentum mass, also as expected from uh, observations and from theory. And here is just to see how, how uh, the, uh, the averages over all the components in all the sample look like and they uh, we see the the uh, the most spherical are the classical bulges goes to pseudo bulge, uh, to the spheroids the pseudo bulges are more flattened and on the lower axis we have the retained fraction of angular momentum which we consider to be one of the fundamental properties of uh, apart mass of uh, when looking at the buildup of structure. 
Now the important, the interesting thing comes: how do these structures actually form, right? So uh, on the on the top, you can see the in situ mass fraction, and in our twenty five galaxy sample, we clearly see that only the stellar halo have a significant accreted fraction if we do this kind of separation. And we also see nicely how the um, the sequence of uh, of formation, star formation in the various uh, components from <clears throat> the classical bulges that have the, the actually the spheroids that have the, the largest half mass formation redshift to classical bulges, uh, pseudo bulges, and then to the inner disk if we just care about the, the central uh, components in galaxies. And uh, on the bottom one, it's uh, are the quantities that quantify the, uh, the baryon assembly of the redshift zero uh, structure. So the assembly time seems to be quite similar, but they are shifted, right? So the assembly time of the progenitor material for all uh, three dispersion dominated components is around four giga years. But the time when they actually collapse inside the halo is different. Okay, so this we all this um, an analysis we uh, we we did based on um, selecting sort of by eye by uh, like making a physically informed uh, classification of the components that we saw in this twenty five sample. But if you want to go to larger galaxy samples you need to have some automatic way to deal with how many components are in each galaxy. And uh, basically we used for that uh, a sample of 464 galaxies from the Eagle. So they're not very high resolution, uh, but this makes uh, work a bit easier because everything works faster. And we, we introduced uh, an automatic, um, um, Selection crit information criteria that can pick that can rank our models uh, based on some statistics. So here you see that in our in our galaxy sample we have some galaxies that have three, some galaxies that have four, five, six. We didn't let it go to 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 larger numbers, so we kept it at six. The interesting thing is when you have a large sample of galaxies, you we can also think of can we actually define some sort of generic galaxy components in this way. So what we tried was to look at the same uh, input feature space, basically the two components of angular momentum and the binary energy, but we added also, so in, uh, we added also the dispersion of the particular distribution. So in this plot, uh, there's a lot of things. <laughs> uh, each point is actually one component of one galaxy. And if we do a 6D Gaussian mixture in this 6D uh, in this parameter space, we can select five types of uh, of dynamical components in this sample. Uh, so we have a thin and a thick disk as before. This is very easy to select by this way. The problem comes actually for the the central component. We have something that we call in this case spherical bulge, which is close to what previously we were calling classical bulge and something that we call a flat bulge because for, for this separation in particular, we don't see that much traces of rotation. So we, we see it's a very flattened structure, but not much traces of rotation. And as before, we can take out a stellar halo, which is in green. Ahora, sorry, two minutes, please. Yeah. So, um, then we look at the, uh, at the observational properties of these components and they split nicely and mostly as expected. Uh, the interesting thing is that we could, now we also look in much more detail at how do they populate the uh, stellar population uh, space. So uh, iron and uh, alpha over iron, which we trace by oxygen in this case and the stellar age. So we see that there is a, if we do this dynamical selection, um, there is a very large overlap in stellar population properties. Um, and uh, just a, a 
cautionary note. Uh, here I'm showing, for example, uh, the CERCIC, this, uh, the CERCIC index distribution for all the components that we found. And basically this, uh, this uh, figure clearly uh, suggests that um, do not use uh, uh, CERCIC index to define, to, to separate uh, components in galaxies. Um, I will jump this part because it's not, I mean, we, this paper is going to be out, uh, I think, in uh, about a week or two. Um, just to say that we don't see any, we only have one dex mass, uh, stellar mass uh, spread. We don't see any, uh, any correlation be between the dynamical uh, disk to total mass ratio and the stellar mass. And of course, these galaxies are, do not actually reach the values that we expect for the Milky Way. So my conclusions are that if we use an agnostic data-driven approach uh, to analyze simulated galaxies, we can, we can separate a few distinct class of galaxies that uh, coexist in the central regions. And the important thing is that these different um, components separated just by dynamics do have uh, different formation histories. And um, my, my biggest conclusion is that the central regions of galaxies are very messy, so it's quite easy to do an ana analysis of disks, <laughs> but for uh, bulge components, spheroids and stellar halo is much more complicated. And just to, to mention that this method can also be used uh, we're working on making it usable on observational data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aura. <clears throat> I am sure that there will be some questions. Yes, we have a question already from Peter Irving. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, that was quite interesting. Thank you. I, I was thinking about your plot where you showed the edge on views of the different components for that first galaxy. And then you were sort of went on to compare them to the Milky Way. Um, yes, yes, perfect. So the, in the upper row, the second plot from the left, the, your thick disk uh -huh. looks, I, I wanna say it looks slightly X shaped to me. And so I'm wondering whether A, did this galaxy form a bar? And B, uh, is it possible that your thick disk component is related to the boxy peanut bulge of the bar? I, I, looking at it, I'm guessing that's probably much too large to match. Uh, so in this galaxy, no. Uh, so this galaxy, I think, only had a very weak bar. At ratio zero does not have a bar. And uh, um, this appearance of the thick disk is actually related to something seen in a lot of simulation, which is the, uh, the flaring of the disk. So by doing this kind of uh, decomposition, the part of uh, the, the stellar particles that would flare would be associated. Okay. With this. Just, just as, a, as a caution, if you try comparing this to something like the Milky Way, I think from observationally, I would say the Milky Way has two quote unquote pseudo bulges, one of which is the boxy peanut bulge of the bar. And the second is the nuclear stellar disk that Matteo was talking about. And there may or may not be any kind of classical bulge in the Milky Way. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. But we, uh, so um, when we did uh, this comparison, we were looking more at the thin thick disk of the Milky Way. Um, there is another series of paper by Tobias Book that uh, where they use, uh, where we use a, a different galaxy, which has a bar. And actually, for example, that, that galaxy, if we, uh, separated, but not in this 3D parameter space, but in the action angle, the, in the same way, you don't see a classical bulge. We only have the bar, the thin disk, and the stellar halo. So, yeah, I mean, in, in this case, um, the, the purpose of the paper was to compare more with the Milky Way uh, disk than with the bulge. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question is by Daniel Severino. Uh, hi, Aura. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First, uh, I would like to understand the in situ fraction. 
that's the fraction of, a, of the stars formed in that component? Uh, no. So, it? okay. So that's, uh, I didn't have time. This is also a big uh, misunderstanding, I think, between um, people doing simulation and observations. So in, in simulation, what, what, what we call in general, or I call in situ, is a star that form within the main progenitor halo. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't mean that when it formed, it was part of the same class of components. Uh, it, it could have formed in a disk and what the rest Migrate of, uh, to the, to the center, But yes. today you find it as part of the... Uh, of the galaxy the of, the... of the galaxy yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and if it form outside so if it form in a in an infalling structure that wasn't inside the virial radius at the time of formation then it's considered accreted that's mm -hmm. the that's the easy definition to do in simulations in observation you can actually not do such a thing so i'm not sure actually when people compare accreted fraction in simulation observation or the quantities mm -hmm. are really comparable yeah. That's, that's difficult. Well, in our case, we also distinguish the, the stars in the barge form in the disk to see the, the migration. Uh, no, this is, this is something that we're doing now. So uh, in this, uh, in, in this uh, first two papers, we just tra trace back the, the mass of each component to see how it assembled. What we want to do now is basically apply this method at various redshifts and see how the mass migrates from one component to the other. But it's a kind of a different uh, approach. Uh, my second comment is about the Celsius index. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, I was so surprised that you, for budget, you find a very relatively low Celsius index. Does it depend on the number of components that you're including? It seems to me that if you are adding a, a halo and a bulge, it's difficult to get a, a debacolor profile because you need both a inner slope, very steep slope, but also a, um, a envelope, right? To get the, mm -hmm. the end equal for profile. So I think, um, but I think that's the thing is like, if you do a dynamical selection of, of particles, mm -hmm. then you would see a clear di difference between the stellar halo, which is loosely bound, okay, which is uh, treated as a separate component and the central regions, which are very bound and dispersion dominated. Mm -hmm. So then of course, if you look at the, uh, the two, now imagine that the magenta, which is the halo, would be blended in together with the red lines. Mm -hmm. And then if you try to fit something, which is the sum of the magenta and the red, you would get, get, a, you would get a much higher Celsius index. Mm -hmm. But yes. the, if, you, if, if, if the bulge is just the dynamical dispersion dominated component in the center, which is bound, we find it uh, that it has a specific index growth. Yeah, so it depends on the definition. If you make a definition only on angular momentum, not on, not on bound uh, structure, mm -hmm. then you find that the, at least what we did in 2015, then you find that the uh, spheroidal component, both bound and unbound uh, structure, looks like a debacolor profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here, yeah, if, if you would sum here the three dispersion dominated components, maybe you would get a four for the Celsius index. Yeah. Okay, yes, we need to move on. So one very, try to be quick, uh, yes, uh, please. One very quick questions and a quick answer also, Aura, please, from yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, thanks, Aura, for your really nice talk. Um, very quick question on the various dynamical components. Do you think we would able we would be able to see these in a line of sight velocity distribution, or would you need full swatch shield modeling to dissect the various components you see? I think we need the full swatch shield modeling, and that's what we are trying to do now, basically to couple it to uh, observations. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you very much, Aura and everyone that participated in the discussion. So, Patricia, uh, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen and your talk.
Can you see now? Yeah, we see the present presenter view. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I think if you go in and then there's a button where you can swap the screens if you press. Oh. Oh, perfect. No? perfect. Yes, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry, I had to switch because I, I left home today and I took the computer that it was in mine. And so I had to yeah, finish the, the, the presentation as I was uh, yesterday here. Yeah. So, um, I, sorry, um, I'm gonna talk about the cellular populations uh, in, in nuclear uh, uh, this and um, also in another structures. And well, this is part of the uh, work that I've done with the time collaboration. I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, well, ideally, um, we do what Aura does with uh, her simulations and, and calculate the orbits of the stars and see which one are rotating in circular orbits, but we cannot do that in galaxies. So I remember, uh, I don't know, some of you uh, were at the, at the conference of the bulge that was in Oxford like years, years ago, and there was a lot of discussion about why it's a bulge, no? So I think um, most people do the definition of uh, the photometric definition. So it's the inner extra light, no? That is apart from the exponential of uh, this. And that means that um, uh, a lot of things can be part of the bulge. Uh, so can be an uh, um, special dominated uh, bulge. You can have also nuclear rings, nuclear disks, nuclear uh, inner uh, bars, etc. And also uh, we call uh, uh, bulges to the, uh, to the bars in a uh, when they uh, thicken uh, the inner parts. And that's fine. I mean, as far as we know what we are talking about, and it's important to make the, dif the distinction because in principle, uh, all the components are forming different ways. No? So we hear the first day, you know, that uh, there is a scenario now. We we'll see also uh, Constantine's talk, and there's more people talking about this scenario, you know, where you have a, a very strong star formation at early times at a uh, higher than two, uh, where it can be due to mergers or it can be due to uh, the formation of uh, plants for these instabilities and uh, due to the, to the high gas accretion and the immigration to the center. And that will form like uh, an asteroid uh, dominated bulge. Then, uh, with time, we'll start to accrete gas and form a disk. And when the disk is mature enough, uh, it will uh, be unstable to the formation of bars. And it can, uh, the bars can uh, produce torques in the gas uh, that flows to the center and creates like uh, disks and rings and other uh, superstructures. So, let me try to take this out. I have something in the middle of the scene. Okay. Uh, contrary to what it was said on Monday, this is believed to be an important component of the galaxies and be from between uh, 30 or 60 percent of all the massive bodies. No, so it's not nothing. It's not something marginal. In any case, um, uh, there is a lot of debate about how to separate um, uh, this component or the dispersion dominated component from the from the components from at later times. And I think most people think the best way is uh, to use the Corbini relation or, uh, or the size uh, sector relation. And uh, this is when I took this, uh, this plot from the uh, review by uh, Dimitri Gattati in 2019, I think it's, that is incorrect. Um, he shows as well that, uh, well, that um, in terms of the stellar population or the colors, there is not such a clear difference between a classical and I'm going to keep calling them classical and zero because it's easy. Uh, classical and zero balls, no? I mean, uh, most people say that uh, zero balls are blue and uh, have younger populations, etc. But really, that's because they have a difference in mass. I mean, you go to the massive end and you have a, a lot of the dispersion dominated galaxies and the, and the low massive end and you have all the zero balls, no? And um, I mean, we know that uh, uh, the deterioration between the, uh, the age of the population and the mass of the galaxy, and it's seen in all the components, no? It's seen in the disk, it's seen in, the, well, in elliptical galaxies, and it could be that we see it in the, in the bodies, no? So um, um, I haven't seen any convincing study like finding differences really uh, between uh, the bodies of, uh, of uh, the so called classical and silver bodies. And in fact, I mean, most people think that when you uh, compare the number of data given stellar mass or velocity dispersion, they follow the same relation as elliptical galaxies, no, no dynamical. 
Well, the thing is that, um, well, as uh, we hear before, and we our also mentioned, uh, dividing um, like uh, dispersion dominated structures and um, and, and this, you know, in this case, all just uh, requires in fact kinematics, no? otherwise you're gonna do it wrong. And also, I wanna also put that that you have a lot of projection effect that most people don't take into account. No? Um, this is an example, um, we took a, some numeric uh, psychological simulations um, and ran a transfer code to generate like synthetic images and we incline it to 45 and 90 degrees. No? So this is the one. Can you see my, my cursor? No. No. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. So this is one simulation. This is a phase zone inclined to 45 degrees and, and edge on and the second and the third. And we analyze it doing a full spectral feeding. Uh, uh, I mean, this is the the uh, synthetic images were made to mimicking the Khalifa observation, no? the same resolution, the same everything. And so we run our code of full spectral feeding and, and derive uh, uh, the distribution of uh, masses and uh, fluxes no? as a function of ages and metallicity as well, although I didn't put it here. And then, I mean, I'm showing this because I'm going to show it as well for the real galaxies. Uh, we calculate, I mean, what we get is always the contribution of uh, every model's uh, with a given age to the final spectra, no? So wait for the for the model with a given age to metallicity. And then what we saw in the maps uh, are the mean weight values uh, that it can be both in light or in mass. So in light, you're gonna always gonna be biased towards the young stars, but at the same time, light is what you observe. So you can have a lot of errors hidden in the mass weighted values as well. No? You can put it here an example, no? The, you have a, this, the, the flux distribution as a function of age, and you see that uh, uh, here you don't see anything because probably you have a, a small comp a small fraction of very young stars that because they are very young, they stick in. You see here this jumping flux. Okay. Anyway, so um, um, sorry, it's in Spanish because that's a graduate, graduate student project. Um, this is uh, this is showing the DH as a function of radius um, for the, the galaxies. Uh, this is uh, weighted in, in mass and in luminosity, both, no? It's gonna, I mean, I, I always like more luminosity because of what I said before. And the blue is, uh, when, when we analyze it like a, a phase zone, I mean, with the projector, of course, I mean, with the projector that we do with observations, but you, can, you cannot get rid of the, of the components that are in front of you. So this is the phase zone, uh, the blue, the, the red is the one inclined to 45 degrees and the green is the, is the one it's shown. And what you can see uh, that especially in the region of the bulge, you can have a lot, a lot of difference depending on uh, the projection of the galaxy. So, well, uh, imagine that you are analyzing the bulges with a fiber, no, with a small one or with a slit, and that you cannot even be aware of this. And you can hidden a lot of components that you, that you don't know. And you can also well, take a lot of this and on, et cetera. Anyway. We need very high resolution and we need uh, to have not only self-relations, but also uh, dynamics, you know, in the kinematics of the components. So well, that's why uh, we did uh, the one uh, Dimitri uh, gathered us to make the timer, the time inference being used in a stratigraphic degrees. Actually, the, the goal of the project is to derive uh, the, the epoch where the these uh, get mature enough dynamically mature to uh, being stable to bar in the cities, no? to develop Mars. But, and I'm gonna say much about that because uh, there is fantastic stuff like Camilla that's prioritized and also Dimitri's Garot is, uh, Dimitri uh, has a tool. So you can watch them if you haven't done it yet. So uh, we are observing 25, 21 galaxies uh, very, uh, very nearby. So we can uh, reach resolutions better than uh, 100 parsecs. And they are not very, uh, I mean, we, we, we try them to be a uh, phase zone, I mean, or with low inclinations. No? Uh, they, we covered a range of maps, which is uh, quite large and also uh, morphological ties. So we should have a beautiful, well, although I, I have to say as well that because the project uh, aimed to explore the epoch of this, uh, the epoch of bar formation, uh, the, the galaxies are selected on purpose to, to have bars and to have a, and it has features, no? so it's not a complete sample, but you can learn a lot about uh, the formation of structures even if it's not. No? So here uh, there are some examples. I mean, we are targeting only the, the very central parts uh, because the galaxies are very nearby. 
Um, well, this is a, the, actually the, the goal of the project behind Timer. I don't know if saying something about this or, or, or just leave the people to go to Camila's because that's, that's not the topic of my talk. But um, yeah, I, I think they better uh, see Camila's talk. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the populations today, the stellar population. So we have a lot of uh, different uh, morphologies, not only in, in the shape of the galaxies, but also in uh, the mission morphology, H alpha, we have galaxies with AGNs, we have AGNs with a star formation, we have a star formation. This is, for example, three examples of galaxies, the ones that I'm going to show you. And those are the, the H alpha maps. So uh, we have uh, here 46, uh, 43 that have uh, central leaks, and maybe some uh, nuclear spirals. Uh, we have a uh, 4361 that don't show any uh, H alpha emission. And um, uh, sorry. Oh, we have here uh, uh, 1097 that uh, have a, a, a nuclear ring of the star formation. Yeah. I don't know what I've done. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to start with the old galaxies. No? Um, this is uh, 4643. And uh, those are the kinematical maps. Uh, Gadot is told them in, in his talk, but this is the one, well, this is the line of sight uh, velocity, this is the velocity dispersion, and those are the, the higher or medium components, the H3 and H4. Um, uh, you can see here already in the velocity in the, in the radial velocity map, but also uh, with the because there is an anticorrelation between the H3 and the and the velocity, that you have a higher rotating disk in the center. In fact, the disk. Is rotating a uh, uh, higher speed than the rest of uh, the, the main disk. No? And also, you can see it here in the velocity dispersion because it's a lot with respect to the surroundings. No? This is a bar, the bar has high velocity dispersion, and um, these are the maps of the stellar population. So, what you see here, when, uh, you can see better here in the profiles, but you have younger ages normally, uh, much higher metallicity in the nuclear uh, disk, and uh, lower alpha beta field. So, um, um, we can see uh, better what's happening uh, in the profiles. So this is the age, uh, metallicity, alpha, beta, phi, and sigma. So um, we define a uh, kinematical uh, radius of the disk. Uh, in fact, with the maximum of the velocity versus the sigma, but coincide with the with this point with the drops in the, in the velocity dispersion. And and so you can see that inside the the nuclear ring, uh, the the ages are all. No? So when across the whole, uh, sorry, across the whole disk, but not only that, uh, you have a very steep uh, edge gradient. So that means that the, the formation of this structure, which is quite massive and and, and start, uh, um, yeah, I start to be really long ago. Uh, it lasts for at least, uh, well, I think I, I put some arrows. <laughs> sorry. So um, the the edge gradient is like about mm, two point five years per kilobarsis, so it's quite large. Um, that, that's set the limit of the duration of the star formation from this structure. So it cannot be that, uh, it couldn't be that, uh, that sort. And also um, look at the, we, sorry, I don't know what happened. Your, your rich metallicity is quite high. So the star formation rate, um, uh, yeah, uh, has to have uh, been high as well. No? Uh, you, don't, you don't get to such high metallicities with a, uh, with a low star formation rate, even if you hold it for a long time. And, and well, also the, the low alpha beta phi compared with the with the surroundings uh, indicate, indicate this. When you do a, a two-dimensional photometric decomposition, um, you get a, you can reproduce the surface dynamic profile with the this and, and the inner uh, the nuclear this and, and the ring, the bar and the main this. And you don't really need like a classical compound. That happened in all galaxies by one in the whole sample. So in general, the photometric decomposition doesn't need a classical watch or expression dominated watch. Although you can always hide it with the projection, the projection, no? as I mentioned before. Well, this is um uh, <coughs> this is another example. Uh, this is a, a, a weekly bear galaxy uh, that is very phase on. So up here it's difficult to, to hide anything because the explanation is very low. Uh, it's also a, a massive galaxy. 
Um, you can see here the same story, very steep uh, age gradients in the, in the center, um, um, high metallicity and low alpha velocity, although here in this case. Okay, this is an example of, uh, we have uh, like about half uh, galaxies that saw this old uh, nuclear disk and half of the galaxies that uh, saw uh, uh, this, uh, that is still forming stars. In fact, it manifests as a form of a ring because um, the, the, the gradients, uh, sorry, but I don't have the gradients for this one because I, I couldn't finish the, on time. Um, but you have to believe me that uh, the, the, the nuclear ring this galaxy is like the rim of the, of the nuclear uh, the nuclear beast, no? So it's a still, uh, formula is still growing. And, uh, well, uh, we saw it in, uh, in first talk of uh, the moment, no? That is, come, I mean, uh, the whole disk, no, come from uh, due to the, the, the bar is growing, no? Like, um, uh, uh, Giving away and one momentum and growing with time, so we can, in principle, trace the the rate that with the the bar. If the, I mean, if the if the this is growing because of this, we can, in principle, will be able to uh, to grow the uh, to time to time the growing of the bar and compare as well with uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, so only a uh, one one galaxy out of the nineteen uh, so signatures of high dispersion dominated this. No? As I say, about half of the galaxies, so all the stars in the nuclear rings, about uh, half of them, so uh, and still forming a nuclear disk. But in the center, still they have a very old edges, no? So that's uh, that's still true. So this, in principle, I mean, um, it's uh, compatible. Like to this, uh, this slide from 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 Matia uh, told this morning. Uh, with this model where the, the, the nuclear uh, disk formed just after the formation of the bar. And, and well, in some cases, no, in some galaxies, it seems that the formation is high and then it stop. And in others, uh, it seems that it, it keeps going. Well, and all of this is also compatible with a really very early formation of a very uh, dynamically mature uh, disk. No? Um, and I have to say that there are two talks um, in, in this, uh, this conference by Federico Lely and Francesca Riccio, and also I want to show you uh, this work no, by Toff, where they take advantage of, the, of uh, a cluster that is make magnifying the light of the galaxy to uh, measure the rotation curve uh, uh, for a galaxy at relative 2.1468. No? The galaxy doesn't show emission lines. Uh, when I show you this is the spectra, so it's a it's a beautiful virtual line, so it's apparently a galaxy that is quenched, but it has a, a very high rotational support. No? Uh, it's rotating like a disk. Um, I thought I had an American here, but it doesn't matter. But first, ah, yeah, here. Uh, it's rotating like at the same level as uh, this galaxy, so those stresses. No? And the galaxy follow the same the dynamical age relation that, uh, that follow the question. And galaxies, but uh, but it's, it's, it's actually a disk, no? And as I say, I, there are all the other talks uh, in this conference uh, that also using uh, lens uh, lens uh, lensing uh, measure the rotation of the massive galaxies, finding uh, like a very high rotation, no? And also, um, they uh, so Patricia, the, sorry, the, sorry, uh, two minutes, please. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, this is the, the maps of the 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 age, the age, the mass, and uh, the specific star formation rate and distinction. And this is the profile. And you can see that also because this is in log age in years. But also the 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 gradient of this galaxy is already uh, very high. You also know? uh, doesn't seem to have from like very uh, rapidly. You know? So, well, just to mention that um, we are also enlarging the sample uh, using uh, uh, data from the fans collaboration that have also news data, but uh, also molecular gas and HST images. And well, we are also gathering AstroSat uh, images as well now. Um, those are um, some of the profiles in the age you know, for. Uh, 
focal axis uh, and the different colors indicate the different components of the galaxy that lead by along the bar, the ring, the center. Um, and well, you can see as well that uh, we have some uh, these in the center that are, are very young, no, because they are still uh, forming stars. But we when we don't have that, we usually have like a very steep gaze in the center. No? Um, and this is well, this is a comparison of the age profile with the mass uh, that so that you still have this dependence of the of the age, overall age with the mass that I think is part of the reason why people see differences uh, between uh, pseudo bulges and bulges. Uh, well, uh, we can also get like um, the the inflow, uh, the radial motions due to the bars uh, by genes modeling. We are doing this so we can compare uh, the growing of the bar with the inflow that uh, we measure. So stay tuned. And I'm going to uh, uh, leave here, I think. So we think that nuclear these are probably more common than stone. No? Uh, uh, they can be also revealing a very early epoch for this formation. Uh, they are more metal rich and less alpha enhanced than these running. So the, bars that, no, the bars are usually alpha very free, um, enhanced and all as well, so similar to the, to the Milky Way. Uh, the gradients reveal a uh, long time scale for star formation. And uh, well, that's that's something that uh, because um, something that I mentioned Manuela the other day, but uh, I, I didn't have time to put it to put back the, the plot. Uh, that the, the nuclear ring in the in the Milky Way seems to be uh, forming stars at a lower rate than, than the rest. And people don't know uh, why. And we are seeing as well that the the in the result of star formation in sequence that relate the star formation rate versus the, the mass density, nuclear rings are also usually outliers, um, but you can find outliers. No, usually they are in the low end as well, but sometimes are also with a higher star formation that they that it will correspond due to the mass density. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you very much. Um, do we have questions? Yes, Peter, please go ahead. Um, hi, very interesting talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, just a brief comment about NGC 1097. Uh, which yeah, is I know. The, 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 sorry. Well, I say it's, it's obviously a very actively star forming ring, but it can't, I, I would think, I would suggest it can't be a very young nuclear disk because there is a nuclear bar inside the nuclear yeah, yeah, yeah exactly the 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 age i mean the age in the center is so it's only the ring but the the age in the center is very old awesome. oh. i cannot go back but yeah in fact you have a very steep grade because although it's still growing no um we, yeah the age uh, right no, no 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 here yeah, no, the age is, uh, yeah, the age is actually uh, very old inside. Well, you're showing us 1291. You need, you need oh. to go back one slide. Yeah. Right, right. So the, the red the red means that, uh, yeah, 12 giga years here. So the, the center is, the, the, the age grade is steep and it's still growing or still have, in the rhythm of the disk, you still have a start formation, obviously, but it's true that the center of the, I mean, the center of the disk is, is old. So, and the metallic is high in the center as well. Here, but this so. makes me think as, as sort of a maybe a more general comment that the idea that if you see a star forming nuclear ring, it's been forming stars continuously since the bar formed. Well, it depends. Like, you the, 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 can, the, the, can change the radius, no? Because if uh, it's what Matthias saw today, no? That uh, if the bar is growing, the, the position of the rings can also, uh, I mean, right. also, but, also but, if, if, the, if the mass concentration increases in the center, you can change also the position sure, of the but, but that means that the, 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 this period of growth, the, there's sort of a lower limit on how long this takes. Ah, yes, sure, it's a lower limit. Although you think that when you form the, dark, the bar, no, there's also, a, Peter was mentioned this on Monday, he has some work on this. When you form the bar, you have, you start to form a star, no? you have some kind of a star that's there, and if nothing, stop it. Well, you know, but you say, you're right, it's a lower limit, yeah. Right. Um, I think we should stop here. We are exactly 15 minutes late. 
and we should take a break now of uh, 15 minutes and come back at 10.45 Central European summer time. Um, I will leave the Zoom session on. We can simply turn off uh, cameras and microphones and come back in 15 minutes for the first discussion session, which will be chaired by, by Elena Valenti and Chris Brook. Okay, so see you in 15 minutes at 10.45 Central European summertime. It's about, um, all right, <laughs> so I think that it shouldn't come uh, as a surprise that if the first uh, question that we thought about is about um, terminology and, or as uh, um, Dimitri um, said, um, nomenclature. So the idea is that um, we, well, as, as soon as we um, kick off the Slack, um, I start seeing uh, one of the very uh, first uh, um, comment was, should we really need to keep uh, um, classifying uh, bulge as classical and, and pseudo bulges? And really, I invite all of you to skim through the Slack. Um, Dimitri has already um, created a, um, a dedicated channel um, called the Manco Tour. So um, it's my taken from um, what is happening on Slack and, and also um, from the feedback that uh, reviewers and invited um, uh, speakers have provided me um, before the start of this meeting, that uh, maybe the, the, the term pseudobulges can be already, uh, well, the, uh, it, it is my understanding that it is sort of general agreement that the, the, the term pseudobulges is by far the most misleading. Um, so the idea, we, we, we are not going to uh, sort it out this uh, during this discussion, but the idea is to just uh, try to um, hear from many of you what should, well, in which direction we should go, whether um, we should apply a morphological um, uh, classification and also talk about scales, taking into account that these are um, limited, constrained by the resolution and then the object we are um, dealing with. Um, should we talk about process rather than the mor uh, morphological um, classification? So, um, yeah, it, so just let me, if someone wants to start um, throwing an idea, as I said, the idea, the, the, the goal is to keep, um, uh, keep going with the discussion, possibly through, through Slack. We also thought about opening a pool for the participant to, to vote. Although if you check the, the thread, the nomenclature, there is already a sort of uh, polls going on. So just um, let me know, raise your hand. Ah, Martin, I think he was the, the one raising the hand. Uh, yeah, thanks, Elena. Um, I'll be quick because I have to lecture actually in a few minutes, I'll have to. All right, okay. <laughs> um, but um, I just wanted to comment on this because People who may remember the, the meeting 15 years ago in Oxford already that was mentioned on bulges, the whole free Wednesday afternoon turned out in a discussion on exactly that question. Uh, Several tens of people remained the whole afternoon arguing about this. And the gist was that uh, pseudo bulge, sorry, I was a proponent, was not good because it means a fake bulge. So if you want to talk about bulges, we should talk about real bulges. And the definition, I think, of the bulge is something that bulges out of the disk. So it has to be thick. So that would exclude you know, nuclear bars and concentrated disks. So it seems to me that if we want to keep the definition of a bulge as something that bulges out, there are only two types of bulges, classical bulges and boxy bulges that we know to be the thickened part of bars. The other types, including most photometric bulges that could be you know, just concentrated disk would not qualify. So uh, in fact, in the discussion this evening, one question I thought I would raise, maybe it's not useful now, is that photometric bulges is perhaps not such a useful concept to use because it really doesn't say anything about the three-dimensional structure or the dynamics uh, while bulges really be thick. So I'm sure it's gonna generate a lot of comments. Unfortunately, I do have to run, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I see Eric is ready to comment, so uh, I'll, I'll listen to 
hopefully this can be online before tonight's session so that people like me who need to animate the session can can listen to it uh, before this evening okay thanks a lot for throwing the first seat <laughs> for the discussion see you later then eric yeah hi can you hear me yeah so I'm, I'm not gonna say much because i've already written so many lines on the slide that it's really not uh, fair uh, but I just wanted to give an historical perspective very quickly is um, very, I mean, a long time ago, we had uh, galaxies, we imagine galaxies being done, being basically framed with a disk and a bulge. And I think historically it went on with, you know, photometric fitting. We fitted the disk and everything that remains was called the bulge. And I think Marta, I fully agree with Ma Ma what Marta said. The bulge at that time was thought to be something that bulges out of the plane of the disk. But because of that historical reason and the techniques which were implemented then, uh, we, left, we, we were left with, okay, everything that is not the main disk now, so basically the central region, whatever it is when you see an inclined uh, galaxy, will be called the bulge. And then, you know, it went on with these classical uh, pseudo disks, rings, and so on, and the long list that Dimitri has advertised in, in some of his talks. And so I think my, my conclusion from the discussion is, I think we know better today. We have experts who are actually lo looking at this in very much detail, which doesn't, you know, um, put any bad light on the fact that we need uh, to try to understand the structure, the photometry structure in these galaxies because we don't see them edge on all the time, edge on has other problems. So that's the first part I would say. There's an historical um, uh, thing that drove us to this, but I think we, since many years, and Marta reminded us it's 15 years ago, this discussion already took place. We know better, this central structure has a huge complexity, which most of the time have nothing to do with what the, the word bulge means. And so we should, really consider this. Um, and the second thing is uh, also something that many people said in, the, in, in Slack, which is that we have so much data now, we have resolved data, we have you know, stellar population, kinematics, uh, talks from Patricia and many others during these this sessions showed it. Um, so let's exploit this. Let's, let's really do the physics with kinematics, dynamics, stellar population, uh, like we're trying to do for the Milky Way in a very different way and really interpret this and maybe not, you know, forget about the word bulge because that was meaning something very specific a long time ago and it still means something. And it's still also associated with a, actually a formation process. And I think this is my opinion and I shut up now. I think this is very misleading and we know better. We have really the experts and the data to do a much better job today. Thank you, Eric. Um, who's next? I think uh, Chris and then Simon. Chris? Um, yes. Okay, no, yeah. Ah, okay. That was really covered. <laughs> On the sun. Ah, okay, so Simon? Yeah, so I think I, I agree with everything that Eric says. Uh, um, but I kind of disagree with the conclusion. And I think it's because of the different domains that, that, that he and I are, are, are working in to some degree. Um, most of the objects I'm looking at, you know, we're going from a barely resolved galaxy at all to something where we're trying to glean out whether we think this has is a single component system or a multiple component system. And we've got no idea whether that's a, a maybe a nucleus if we start to see a component or what kind of a bulge component is. So we need some terminology to say, we think this is not a spheroid. We think this is not a disc only system. We think we've got a two component system. There's something there in the middle. And we need a word to define it. And I think, you know, bulge kind of, kind of fits that bill. I absolutely, I see, I see Eric shaking his head, which is good. Um, I absolutely agree that, I mean, at, at low redshift with the, the kind of quality from the S4G, we have such fantastic data. You bring the kinematics to bear. You shouldn't really be talking about bulges. You should, should never start there. You've got the quality of data to go so much deeper. But it's going to be a while before redshift one or, or, or redshift of a half, we're really able to 
bring significant amount of kinematic data or spectroscopic data to really make this this kind of distinction so we're kind of you know scraping around morphologically we simply don't have that kinematic information so i think we can never make a real distinction between whether we're looking at a spheroid pressure supported system or whether we're looking at some kind of rotating system so we've tended to move towards using the terminology of a compact bulge which, which may be a classical bulge and a diffuse bulge which may be a, a whole myriad of different sins joined together. Um, we still have that word bulging, but we're now at least prefixing it with, with, with something else. Um, again, going back to the historical uh, uh, side of things, I mean, I've always taken a pseudo bulge to basically, you know, I parse it in my brain to say, not a classical pressure supported bulge. I don't really take it to mean anything other than that. It just tells me there's something there which is not that traditional classical spheroidal pressure supported bulge. But I guess, you know, pseudo bulge has evolved, you know, to, to, to mean a variety of other things amongst those that are working with much more detailed data. Okay, that's, that's all. Thanks. I um, think Francesca and then Iris. Yes, I just wanted to add my, my two cents to the nomenclature discussion. So I think the word bulge does have a physical meaning. It's something that bulges uh, out, of the, out of the disc, out of the plane. So it is some kind of, it can be some kind of um, spheroidal or ellipsoidal structure that is not a flattened distribution. So I do think it has a meaning. So I, I agree with, the, with what everyone has said. So I don't like the word pseudo bulge. I much prefer using, so, you know, if we think that we have these dispersion dominated spheroidal systems on the one hand that we call classical bulges or a spheroid, and then you have the bulges, which are formed from the bar because they are bulging out of the plane. So you have these, the boxy peanuts. Um, some people don't like using the word bulge. I know that a few people in the conference don't like using the word bulge for them because they're not um, what we think of classically as a bulge, but they are bulging out of the plane. So that has the physical meaning, but they're just formed in a very different way. And then you have structures like nuclear disks, which are not at all bulges. And I agree that we should not use the word bulge for them because they're actually not bulging out of the plane, right? These are structures that are flattened, that are thin disk-like structures. But I also think that, as Simon was saying, I mean, you know, if you go to high redshifts, it's very difficult maybe to distinguish between these different things. And so I also completely understand that you want maybe something that is a terminology for something that's compact that you can quantify morphologically as something compact and something that you can quantify morphologically as not compact and be a bit agnostic about what that is. And then the other thing that I just wanted to, to bring into the mix and just maybe add a bit more confusion is that um, apart from the nomenclature issue, I, I still i am not fully convinced that a lot of the things that we call compact bulges in kind of unresolved or high redshift studies are we really convinced that these are actually dispersion dominated structures? Because in the local universe, we're seeing so much, so many different things happening in the central regions of galaxies. You have, you know, nuclear star clusters, you have AGN, you have the nuclear disks, the rings. Um, and if you take all of that and blur it together and reduce the resolution, um, and then you try and fit that, uh, you know, maybe if, even if you don't have something that is compact, at low redshifts, but you, you take all of these structures that you have at low redshifts and you, you blur that together and then you try and fit that, might we not also end up with something um, that seems like it's a compact dispersion dominated structure and um, with, with a very peaked photometry, but it might not be. So I'm wondering if that's something that we're worried about or not in, in our fittings at high redshifts. Uh, thanks, Francesca. You sort of introduced my um, last question, but uh, if um, I think I will first uh, hand um, the mic to Iris. Iris, do you still have a question or? Yeah, thank you for uh, this moment. So I, would, I just want to contribute with um, my work, uh, what I learned with my work that unfortunately I missed the deadline and I couldn't present to you. I'm very, very sorry for that. But indeed, um, so what I did uh, was to take a very representative sample of the local spiral galaxy population um, as observed by the Khalifa sample. We tried to isolate indeed the central excess, luminosity excess 
<clears throat> and uh, so we did uh, special results uh, spectrosynthesis <clears throat> of all these galaxies. It's uh, 135 galaxies, so they are quite a lot. They are um, they they this sample includes uh, galaxies that have very few mass or not very few. They are all spirals and debate from 10 to the 9 to the 11 or 12. If I'm not mistaken, let me just check. And so yeah, 9 to 11.5. And when we look at these bulges, we see everything but a bimodality. Uh, that's why I think uh, I, I thought it was important to contribute in this sense, because what we see is a continuity. There's no evidence for any bimodality. So uh, I really, so in everything, if I don't know if I can try to, to just to show you the main plot of this work, could I share my screen? Just just a second, I have to set up this here. Yeah. You should be able now. Okay, thank you. See, just the so in the these are many plots. I try to define the, these uh, galaxies according to the here for instance i show you so according to the quantity of light that belongs to stellar populations older than nine giga years within the central region so as you can see for instance uh, so i divide in three colors just sorry um, so the the low mass galaxies which are the ones given by t0776 <clears throat> Uh, these are the blue ones, and the, the, um, in the bottom part, like NGC 0776, it's the red one in between the green ones. So the, um, the, the low uh, one, so the mass one, um, all the light of the bulge basically are, uh, is given by stars older than 9 giga years, where the low one, it's very few, this light. So mostly younger stellar population. So by looking at uh, this, it's called the, the light that is older than GK years, the stellar populations. So in the first plot, we just do the separation. Where's the other one? So we can see the mass of the is the mean age of the bulge, so, uh, of the stellar populations. And then the total mass of the galaxy for the mass salt, and then its velocity versus the, the bulge. And finally, DPT dies. To show you that there's absolutely no bimodality, they just we, we see continuity with mass. So after this, honestly, to talk about pseudo bulges and classical bulges becomes a bit. Uh, you know, you understand what I mean. Yeah. Okay, sorry, so we, we couldn't hear you uh, very well, but thanks. Um, anyway, um, okay, I think we should <clears throat> quickly move uh, forward, but I, I would like first to hand the, the mic to Odin, if you... Um, can you... Um, sure, to me. Yeah. To Oh, I just had a quick answer to Francesca about your question about um, about if you're defining things based on how the sort of compactness or, or if we're calling that sort of surface density. The short answer is even in the local universe, yes, you do get contamination of things that are star forming that are disky that will still be compact and that will still that will land in that if you were to use something like the um, Corman relation. So, but then it's important what question you're asking. So if you're asking the kind of questions like what Simon asked, which is saying like, oh, what's all the mass, where's all the mass? Well, that contamination will probably not kill your results. So it'll probably, I mean, there's just an uncertainty on it. But to, I mean, they, they're, they're aware of. But if you're looking at an individual galaxy and you're saying, ah, this is absolutely something that people call a classical bulge, on one galaxy and you're using just only compactness for that, then no, then the uncertainty becomes quite 
quite difficult and can and can really be dramatic. So I think when we're sort of separating out these components and calling them things, I think it's very critical and something that's basically is the theme of the responses earlier is that it really depends on what question you're asking and it depends on you on how you're applying things more than just um, just having some some single absolute definition that's going to work in all circumstances. It's very different. Thank you. Um, I think we do have, let's see, um, Federico? Lali? Yes, I wanted to go back to the terminology issue for a moment. It seems to me that the most precise and general terminology that we could use is central mass concentration as something that can be identified photometrically or dynamically in top of the exponential disk. So if we agree in using central mass concentration instead of bold, then there is no problem. But we can also agree that we implicitly call the central mass concentration bulge, and then we use the other terminology, such as classical bulge, boxy peanut, nuclear disk, and whatever, to further you know, identify the uh, structure and dynamics of the central mass concentration. So I don't know what the people, you know, the opinions of the other people are, but it seems we can use simple words to describe what we mean. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chris. Yeah, um, just summarizing and then we'll try and move on I think I think the theme really is just to be very careful of your nomenclature and your definitions right so just explain it I mean for example I prefer pressure supported over classical bulge because I was never really clear what is the classical bulge because it's got nothing about its definition there so I think just being clear I mean for example Manuela mentioned two components in the Milky Way in the Milky Way's bulge, which is the boxy component and then a lower middle city spheroidal component. And, yes, and yet no one really considers that more spheroidal component to be a classical bulge because it's not pressure supported, right? So even just looking at a spheroidal component, we might say that's the classical bulge, but then other people might say, well, no, it's not pressure supported. So, um, you know, another terminology should be used. So I think just be everyone be aware and be very careful of the way you describe things in your paper and <laughs> express the meaning and define things how you wish, but <laughs> clearly. And so I'd like to move on a little bit, which is the next thing that Alan and I wanted to talk about, which is obviously the processes, but I wanted to just kick it off. Well, we've got a lot of processes that can form bulges. I think we're, we've got no shortage of processes that can form, well, not bulges, <laughs> central mass concentrations, whatever you want to call them, okay? So what I'd like to ask is the community also becomes very clear when they're talking about these different processes. And what I mean by that is, for example, clump formation and clump migration, we can have two types, right? So one is the stars that are forming clumps, one is the gas that is formed in clumps and gets driven to the center and forms stars in the middle, and one is the stars moving to the middle. So just be very clear which one you're talking about whenever you talk about these processes. And it's the same with mergers, right? Mergers uh, we have long been considered with bulge formation, but let's be a bit more clear about is this mergers driving gas to the center or is it stars coming from accreted events or is it um, stars that are there getting their orbits disturbed? So mergers really have three processes and they can all form central components of stars. So just let's be very clear in all our descriptions, not only of, you know, of what we're describing, which is the central stellar component, but also be very clear about the processes like unstable disks, bars, disk buckling. They can all move stars to the center, but they can also move gas to the center. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to, wanted to bring that up, but I think the discussion that we can have is, you know, what are the signatures of these different processes? And I think this is one of the central themes. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd just like to thank all the speakers so far and the organizers for the whole concept of this. And I think 
um, if I can start the next part of the discussion by just bringing up the first two talks we had really emphasized for me the importance of getting these two communities together because Simon Driver started with what I think was a provocative, deliberately provocative statement, which is all star formation, early star formation is in spheroids. And then our very next speaker was talking about the Milky Way, Paolo de Matteo, and she said, well, we don't have any star formation in spheroids, in a spheroidal component in the Milky Way. It's all disk driven, it's all in situ. So, I mean, bridging those two gaps, they were both much more nuanced in the end. But one thing I'd like to ask is where does star formation occur? Does star formation only occur in disks? And then, you know, the, the central, what we call central stellar component comes as a result of processes within a disk or in these what Simon calls early slabs. Um, I mean, Adriana showed her very nice decompositions in her talk and she showed, you know, star formation is happening in disks. So do the two communities agree that star formation more or less occurs in disks or do we have any comment on that? I think um, uh, Daniel was the first one raising hand and then we have Paula and who else? Uh, Rain also. Thanks Chris to point that those things uh, in sort of a tal, we did uh, that uh, kind of study. So we took uh, the stars in the bulge, RH1, and then we found the majority of these stars were formed in the bulge. So there was in situ uh, bulge formation, it was not coming uh, from the uh, clams. Uh, the history of clam is mostly a uh, gas history. It's, about, it's just the gas accretion from the disk to the bulge driven by the instability and the migration of clams. But the fraction of uh, stars coming on those, uh, in those uh, clams is small. Mostly we see a star formation in the bulge, a hybrid chip, of course. And one question, because uh, for example, uh, Erika saw uh, with the Aslo 3D that uh, most uh, spheroids are rotating, no? Um, that will produce um, like a rotating galaxy. Uh, yeah, if you have all the star formation in the balls and then the clams also don't have a momentum. And I don't know, would they still are... it, really, it really depends on the time scale. If the time scale of gas inflow is much uh, shorter than the time scale for a star formation, yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. then the, the, the gas goes to the center first and then from, from the stars. Agree, yeah. And in that case, the result will be a galaxy that is not rotating. Yes, and, and then you build a center object. You may have you may have a later gas accretion hmm. when the yeah, when the disk is already big, and then uh, the, the all these uh, wetness parameter depends of the uh, con the mass contribution of the disk. If the mass if the disk dominates the mass, then the disk is gravitationally unstable. If you have some spheroidal component, like a, a barge of a dark matter halo that really dominate the mass, then the gas inflow uh, stops, basically. And then you can build a disk around the, uh, the barge. Mm, okay, thank you. <laughs> you can talk later. <clears throat> Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Dean? Is Paula going? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, oh, it's me. Whoever, Paula, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I wanted to answer uh, Chris's point, but also some of the points that I'm seeing on the chat. Um, in fact, I think that. So in the, in the case of this bulge, this central concentration next that we see in the Milky Way, um, when I said that most of what we see doesn't come from a, a, a classical spheroidal-like uh, uh, formation, I still think that most of what we see comes from the 
it's associated to the thick disk. Now, the problem is that the, the thick disk, and here is where I think that there is another problem of uh, possibly nomenclature or uh, way we are thinking about this. Uh, the thick disk we are talking about, it's, the, uh, it's uh, a metal poor thick disk that today in the Milky Way is very compact. So uh, the, the transition for me between a compact, let's say, 2 kpc scale length today uh, disk, which is metal poor, old, alpha enhanced, and something that eventually we see at high redshift that is uh, also compact, uh, possibly metal poor and alpha enhanced. Uh, here, I think that there is a also a, a way to, to something to possibly clarify in the sense this thick disk, this disk uh, from which most of the bulge comes from to the view of, uh, of uh, part of a community at least. It's not an extended disk. It has nothing possibly to do to the idea of a thin, uh, large extended disk. It's, it's really, it's 2 kpc uh, in scale length and 0, 7, 0, 9, 1 kpc in scale height. So, yeah. Paola, what is the mass that, that is believed right now that, that has it? Uh, okay, so even, even that, I'm not sure uh, that everybody, uh, everybody agrees. Uh, what we derived and what has been used, for example, in uh, some of the models have shown uh, is that this disk is massive. But since, and by massive, I mean uh, about half of the mass, a mass similar to the one that is in disk. So if you take all stars that have ages below nine giga, uh, that are older than nine giga years, and stars that are younger, more or less you have the same mass. Now, the problem is that at the solar vicinity, because the scale lengths of these old component disk and young disk are not the same, at the solar vicinity, you have many thin disk stars and very few thick disk stars, but most of this disk is in the inner regions of the Milky Way. So this is where uh, also the problem of estimating masses can come from. Uh, most of it is not at the solar vicinity, is in the inner uh, five, six KPC. Okay. And the scale lengths have been derived by Bovi, have been derived even before with smaller samples by Bensby. So uh, there are a number of works that uh, that show that this uh, half enhanced thick disk is uh, as a short scale length. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. <clears throat> Who's next? The now, yes, Lynn, it's your turn, isn't it? No, I was going to let Mike go ahead. I think he'll say something more relevant to what was oh. just Paolo talking about. Okay, Mike. Unmute me. Ah, oh, there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, no, I just wanted to concur with Paolo. I, I agree that uh, the more I think about it, the more I think that um, that these that we're actually seeing uh, both components, the metal rich and metal poor components, having arisen in some kind of disk and being related to the disk, uh, the metal rich component especially because um, it, it's de you know definitely a bar uh, and there's a lot of support for that. Um, however, uh, I think even now looking at the metal poor component in our work in the Johnson et al. work, we're seeing some trends with increasing metallicity toward the plane, cylindrical rotation. Uh, and most importantly, when we look at the very dramatic changes in abundance uh, from uh, 500 parsecs and outward, where the abundance distribution shifts from uh, peaking above solar to well below solar and the shape changes, that we're not seeing any dramatic radial changes, um, just change vertical vertical changes. So I think that the the structure you know arises more in the disk. Anyway, sorry to talk so long. Thanks, Mike. Um, Paula, you're now I can respond. All right. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so I, what I can say is also dynamically in Dynamo. We see, if you, if you think that clumps go to the center and, and add to a bulge, and if you, uh, what we also see is dynamically that's happening at the same time, the rest of the disk 
is pumping stars to high velocity dispersions because we can measure the stellar velocity dispersion in dynamo disks. And so we can see that at the same time, you're adding mass to the bulge and you're making a thick disk in the same system. And then also we know that there's a nice gaseous thick thin disk and dynamo that's probably dealing with some sort of inflow instability. So I, I think like decoupling all these things and saying, ah, which one is happening where? That's not realistic. That's not how the universe does it. Um, the universe does it all at once. And it makes your thick disk, prop, at least in, in our dynamo galaxies, it makes the thick disk at the same time it's making, it's making the constituents that add to the bulge. And so we should be thinking of these things kind of I mean, there are applications where we can think of them individually, but if you want to know how structure is made, it's, it's holistic. It's, it's all at once. And it's happening. I, I think Chris's original question is, where do the stars form? Kind of everywhere. And at Redshift 2 is the answer, I think. Thanks. Um, Daniel, you, you raised, no, you raised on your hand. Now, Francesca. Yeah, I just wanted to add on this last point that Dean was making that, um, the, the where, where the star formation is taking place and i think um paula can can say more about this but i think there's a lot at least in the milky way we're seeing a lot more evidence of things forming on some kind of rotationally supported orbits than what we thought in the past i think in the past this idea that you'll have something very massive spheroidal in the center and that's where a lot of the star formation takes place i think what we're seeing more and more um, looking at the Milky Way, but also looking at local galaxies, is that a lot of the star formation seems to be happening um, mostly in these disk configurations. And, and, you know, a lot of what we thought might have been um, something spheroidal actually is stuff that wasn't a disk configuration that brought, that got uh, heated up through, for example, um, instabilities in the disk. So, and also I think this is what's being seen in, in, uh, in the Milky Way in the very metal poor disk. And I think, um, uh, Paula can, can say more about this, but if you go also very old times, um, you see a lot, you still see a lot of disc there, which I think is something that we didn't maybe know maybe 10 years ago I, that this has evolved a bit in the, in the literature. I can again, if it's okay for me not to take up all the time, I can again add another dynamo result that sort of supports what Francesca just said. And it's that um, one of the things we can, another thing we can do with dynamo is measure molecular gas velocity dispersions, which is basically right out at, at high redshift because of your signal to noise. And we find that the molecular gas velocity dispersion is, while higher than a local spiral, much lower than H alpha at redshift on a tip at, in the same galaxy. And we looked at lens galaxies and found the same result. And so this is implying that another, where the star formation is happening, it is happening in a thinner layer in a lower dispersion thing than the H alpha. So it, it's the stars are forming in your cold disk and then it's, and then it's puffing or it's heating by feedback or, or by heating up of the stars or something. So, so it's, it's, it is still, it is, it is probably more disky than H alpha and UV starlight. Starlight are, are telling us at high redshift. Um, Simon, thanks, Dean. Yeah, and no, I, I guess I'm I'm interested a little bit coming back to to, to Chris and, and talking about processes and and um, asking really uh, this 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 idea as to whether we think clump formation and migration is a dominant process that will lead through to to, to bulges. And if so, whether it could be a process that is somehow dependent on the size of the underlying potential so that you more effectively have your clump migration rather than dissipation in your high mass systems. And in your low mass systems, you, you, you have your clump diffusion rather than, than migration. Just curious whether the experts out there want, want to say a bit more about clump migration and whether this you know, is a, a passing phenomena, a dominant phenomena, and whether there might be some mass segregation. Daniel? <clears throat> yes, really, mm, clan migration mostly happens on very massive uh, compact galaxies, hybrid shift. This is the, the area where we see the formation of uh, the spheroids. So, uh, so that's why the potential is very uh, deep in that sense. So that's why we have this, uh, the inflow of, of, of gas to the center. Mm, so that's why I think the, the compact galaxies, high redshift, 
were making the budgets that we see today. Let's see. Uh, Bruce? Yeah, I think there's evidence um, even today in low mass galaxies for, for clump um, large torques and also uh, timescales for migration that's fairly short, and that's for BCD galaxies. Um, the normal dwarf irregulars are they're clumpy, of course, but those clumps are relatively low mass, and it's it's hard to get them because of the slow rotation to do anything in Hubble time. But for BCDs, they're also clumpy, and some of the clumps are quite massive, like a percent, a couple percent, which is about what you need to get migration in a couple giga years, and that would explain the central compaction of BCDs. So, so generally, um, it's easier, as you've just said, to to have these clumps migrate in more massive galaxies especially when they're a large fraction of the mass. As, as Daniel said, when the disk is a high fraction of the total mass, you get these wild instabilities. But there's still, I think, still could be examples of clump migration in low mass galaxies, in particular, these very dense low mass galaxies, the BCDs. Thanks. Um, Peter. Yeah, um, with regards to clump migration and forming bulges. From my perspective as local extragalactic astronomer, it would be useful to, to have some predictions from the clump migration in terms of what are the shapes and let's say radial surface brightness profiles and kinematics of the resulting structures. Because if you just say, ah, it forms a bulge, that that isn't very useful, you know, is that is it forming something that is nearly spherical? Is it forming something that is pressure dominated? Is it forming something that has an exponential profile? Could you get something like a nuclear stellar disk, maybe a thick disk, thick nuclear stellar disk like the Milky Ways out of this? These are the kinds of things that would be useful rather than, I mean, and of course, obviously this is difficult because it means you need really high spatial resolution, but just sort of saying, ah, yes, clump migration forms the bulge or a bulge isn't very useful for local galaxy examination. So is there any way we can get some prediction as Peter is advocating? I can answer that at least this is what we see in the simulations that if we focus on the galaxies with a very quiet merger history that there are no uh, forming uh, many, many stars from ex situ uh, processes. Then we see that the bulge is mostly coming from these secular processes, these internal processes, and the, the bulge is a pressure supported system. It has a debug color profile with very high uh, Celsius index. We can really distinguish the uh, central bulge from the disk just based on the angular momentum. So for me, uh, the bulge is just the structure with very low angular momentum for pressure support the system. And it is quasi spherical. Um, thanks. Um, um, so I think Bruce just raised his hand after <laughs> um, Daniel finished. But uh, first, the, um, I think it was Dean. And then... Yeah, Dean. Um, I think, Peter, the, there is added complexity around answering that question because if you want to look at an NGC galaxy and say, this has something that formed from clumps. You have to unpack, uh, you know, 10 billion years between the clump phase and when, what you're looking at of evolution. And that's everything from much of one to zero, right? And so, and so that's a hard thing. And that is a big missing link now of connecting up studies of clumps and, and and galaxy-wide violent instabilities to the bulges we see in the local universe. I think I think there's some really interesting stuff. I I will I will advertise Marie Martig's talk for her. I think there's really interesting stuff with looking at sort of the information encoded in thick disks in edge on galaxies of using that to sort of tease out uh, things about the assembly history. And if we can sort of connect the properties of bulges to an assembly history. That might be a way, an avenue that we can empirically put together the life history and answer your question of say, so, so for example, if you find a classical bulge, 
surrounded by a thick disc that has no evidence of accretion, that's what your clumpy or instability galaxy has made. Um, I, I think doing otherwise, I mean, asking simulators to run simulations that do the, have the resolution at redshift two to, do, uh, to, to, to resolve what happens in the bulge and then keep running it for the next 10 billion years is also, I mean, it's, 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 I, that's a difficult challenge as well. So it's, it's, not, it's not a trivial thing to answer in a, in a way, it, it would be misleading to give any sort of realistic answer for you to apply that on M31 or something like that. Yeah, Luis, thanks, Dean. Yeah, I think again about Peter's question, um, remembering simulations I did with Frederick Bruno a while back, um, we showed that the clumps, when they came in, made a, a bulge that was not rotating and had a debocular's profile in stars. And part of the reason was that the clumps are big because the turbulence is already high in the disk and the disk is already thick because of that high turbulence. So when, it, when the clumps come in, they're, they're about the same height as the bulge they're eventually gonna form and they all mix up very dynamically. So you get enormous dynamical mixing, which is why it, it ends up a not strongly rotating system. And the devocalers profile is, is somehow a result of that mixing as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, next, Peter. Yeah. So, so thank you, Bruce. That's actually that's actually helpful. In in regard to to Dee's comment, I think the the basic issue is if I see a structure in the center of an NGC galaxy, and it is a flattened, kinematically cool subsystem, a nuclear disk, um, it would be useful to know if if anything like that could possibly be created by clump migration. Or if I can sort of say, okay, that's that's not what's going on. Partly because there's this desire that one keeps hearing that our classifications should be physically motivated, that, it, that is, they should be based on formation mechanisms. But if the answer is it's too complicated to figure out what clump migration is results in local galaxies, then we can't use that in, in some sort of quote unquote physically motivated um, classification system. So I would still think it would be useful to at least have some very broad boundaries on what kinds of structures could and could not result from clump migration at z equals zero. Maybe I can reply. I guess you can still hear. Uh, yeah, Peter, um, it's, when you get clumps, you usually don't get spirals. And today we're getting spirals and, and for good reason, the stellar mass is is dominating the gas mass in the disk. So you're not gonna get the big clumps. So the thin inner disks, I would say, are, are if you want them to be formed from accretion, it would be spiral-like torques, spiral-like torques, thin disk kind of accretion, which is all we get today because we have stellar dominant disks. That changed when it was highly gas dominant or when the gas fraction was higher, because then it's harder to make coherent spirals. You just get clumps and things are thicker anyway. So at that time, you get thick inner parts. At this time, you get thin inner parts from accretion. Now, if it's you know, extra galactic accretion, you can get anything. You can get a, a, a thick thing resulting from mixing there. Um, so let's see who's... Uh, and Mike, is your raise hand a leftover or do you have a question? I think it was a uh, leftover, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> Daniel and then Dean. No, I don't have. Uh, I don't have a, a question. Oh, all right. Okay. Then. Okay. I think it's difficult to uh, decide the bulge uh, properties based on a single process because, as mm, Bruce said, and and others that many different processes that can give you a very similar uh, final result. Any kind of dissipative process would give you a concentrated uh, structure at the center of the potential well. So I think it's, 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 it's complicated to use processes as nomenclature. It's just, that's not the way to go, I think. 
I think I'm just going to say what Daniel said in different words, so <laughs> which is basically uh, a complication over to over what the clumps do is that at the same time as the clumps are doing their thing, you have uh, gas inflows going to the center of the galaxy and what exact structure the two like let's say your clump phase is relatively light for a clump phase but you have a decent gas structure what comes out of that is it something that basically peter you might act you might end up calling a suitable i can't say it's 100 percent ruled out um and i i think it's, it's just is it unlikely probably but um yeah i i think it's just get making that link up i, I think we're just not there yet to where we have like the statistics on simulations confirmed with high enough resolution, high redshift data, like putting all that is, is just not quite in place yet. Um, I think the, we have Stein and then Francesca. Um, yeah, I was wondering, so Bruce mentioned is uh, not strongly rotating compact structures, the focular profiles that, that formed out of this. Um, out of this clump migration process. At the same time, there are also papers that look at uh, idealized merger simulations that are set up as very gas-rich progenitors where they argue that, you know, provided the progenitors are gas-rich enough, you can form a compact rotationally supported system. So is there a, a distinction that can be made between the compact structures formed through gas rich mergers and through versus through through clump migration and and do are they for example distinct in their degree of rotational support or so or maybe i can answer that um, partly um if it's gas rich then the gas of course orbits can't cross so it's so you end up with things that are rotating i mean they may be all counter rotating but at least they're all all rotating as a coherent thing. But if it's largely stellar, you can get all kinds of orbits and even cancellation of orbits, so net low rotation. Um, so, so gas rich and gas poor, no matter where it's coming from, can end up with different things. Um, but I want to comment, Dean made a very interesting point, even in the thick disk clumpy phase, can you still get a a thin disk migration to form a pseudobulge or something. And, and the extra thought there is that even when you bring in gas from a thick disk, as it builds up in the center, that thickness decreases because you're putting more and more mass into the center. So even for turbulent gas, when it reaches the center and has a high mass around it, it the scale height's gonna decrease. Um, just because of the extra gravity. So that's an additional effect. What makes a very old pseudobulge or inner disk could well have something to do with these general migration processes in the gas part, considering also that as it builds up, the things get a little thinner for constant velocities version. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Peter? Yes, I just want to say this is this is useful for me. Um, I want to say there, there are still potentially some observable consequences that could be checked. Um, for instance, if you're generally getting, you know, if you're generally forming structures that have de Vogler profiles, then we can probably rule those out because most local disk galaxies do not have de Vogler bulges. Um, but more generally, I, I think it's it's useful to have the the idea, as, as Daniel said, is it it's not necessarily a great idea to assume we can confidently assert what the formation scenarios of z equals zero structures are. And so I, I'm I'm happy to push back a little bit against the people who want to say that we should we should define things strictly in terms of of you know physical formation scenarios in local galaxies because it's a little uncertain that that really works very well at the moment. Thanks, fair enough. I think uh, uh, we have the um, last two qu uh, question. 
before we wrap up, I think Eric was first and then Federico. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just two two quick comments. One is is I fully agree with Dean. Um, it's it's a very complex set of processes that are mixed. And most of the time when we can resolve them, it means we are looking at them five, 10 years later. So associating a structure with a, with a specific process is a bit illusory, even though we, we, should, we should put efforts in trying to do this. Um, and I want to give you, you a parallel in nuclear cluster formation. There are two scenarios which are merging of, of incoming stellar clusters and uh, gas accretion at the center, which in principle uh, should give you a different angular momentum. And thirdly, there's a lot of orbital angular momentum when these clusters form. And so both basically end up with a flattened structure. And so what do you say? Is it, is it cluster merging at the center or is it gas after five years of more evolution? And I think we are in the same, same uh, paradigm, even more complex because of all these processes. So I, I would, you know, I would, uh, emphasize that part. Uh, I think that what what Steen uh, said. And just to finish, I want I have a question that can be discussed on Slack. Uh, we we keep talking about classical Belgian spheroids, which are spherical. Many simulations use as idealized simulations spherical non-rotating bulges. Bruce mentioned non-rotating bulges. Are these things actually do exist? I don't know any spherical bulge that actually bulges out of the disk. I'm not talking about a bulge which is 30 parsec or 50 parsec. For me, it's not a bulge; uh, it's a cluster. Um, but so I think we should. My understanding of the papers that have been published so far: bulges are flattened, and actually their rotation can be predicted with the same relation that is used for disks. It's just that the flattening reflects the anisotropy, and they do rotate. Of course, there are maybe a few exceptions to this, but if you take the bulk of these real bulges, that's what I would say. And maybe I'm wrong, I think experts like Peter and others can comment on this, but if you know of a spherical bulge, or at least many spherical bulge, because if you have one, it's not really super interesting. I mean, it's interesting for that galaxy, but not for the, the discussion we have. So I would put this in. Uh, maybe we should stop using spherical bulges as um, the relation to the historical thing of monolithic collapse, which doesn't exist. In, and this is not the way I, th I think the central mass concentration are formed. So maybe it's a, something to discuss on Slack. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. You actually um, mentioned this uh, monolithic uh, collapse. That was one of my <laughs> points on, on the list of question, but of course, uh, best to discuss on, on Slack because we are really uh, running out of time. So Federico and then Paula. Actually, I have a question about clamp migration that maybe can be addressed on Slack. So, so far, most of the evidence about clamps come from rest frame, B-band, or UV imaging, as well as H-alpha IQ spectroscopy, which are, of course, excellent tracers for sun formation, but they're not necessarily good tracers for stellar mass. So the question is whether there is a theoretical limit about the masses that these clamps should have in order to really be able to form the bulges that we observe at redshift zero. Because in the near future, we may be able to actually check this with JWST imaging or high resolution ALMA data on the side of the molecular gas. And so it would be important to have you know, very clear theoretical predictions about what the masses of these clumps should be in order to be able to form bulges. Uh, thanks, Federico. Um, is someone want to answer? Otherwise, we can. I would suggest to Bruce and Livia to take note, and uh, and we can address this on the discussion on future perspective. But um, if someone want to answer, otherwise, okay, it seems not. So, Paula, please. Paula, I'm muted. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, no, it was a minor point related to what Eric was saying about uh, the nuclear star clusters. And I think that at least in the Milky Way, these two scenarios, people are trying to, to understand uh, how much one or the other is present, also looking at the chemical abundances. Because the, the global clusters, for example, scenarios should leave a specific um, 
specific characteristics in, in the abundance of the stars that you find in the nuclear star cluster at the end. So, I mean, it's a matter of flattening, it's a matter of rotation, but maybe there are other uh, uh, properties of these stars that we can try to add, to try to separate or to see how much of the two scenarios are present. Thank you, Paola. So, I think it's time to wrap up. I thanks, um, really want to thank every, everyone for this very active discussion and for all the very nice uh, talk and contribution. Um, of course, the, 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 the terminology point um, is going to require a um, long discussion, but at least if we can, uh, we, we can, um, well, my, my suggestion, at least at the beginning, would be to be more uh, cautious and more um, details in, as also suggested by Chris, uh, when writing uh, um, papers, because we know that we're, we're going to use possibly um, term and words that for other community, other people might um, may imply something completely different until we don't reach a consensus of what, um, how we should call uh, politics. So um, I'll probably try to um, um, summarize all that we have been said during this discussion and put it in on Slack and we'll think about it. So uh, if you want to, you can keep um, commenting. Um, so I think, um, we can conclude this morning session. Um, thanks a lot to everyone. And we will reconvene uh, tonight, or well, better say it, at 7 p.m. Central European uh, time. Thanks a lot. Um, have a, either a um, nice lunch or <laughs> whatever, a good sleep, or see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.